also does manifest in man. I pray that you will continue to anoint him so that he will be able to, <clears throat> to be used of you. And even for us, that we shall put in time, energy, and also all the efforts so that we will be able to learn. We thank you for this morning. If we are amid the stars, we get the silver geographical distances. For the glory of your name and for our good, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, Charles. And uh, welcome, everyone, once again. I've um, just started the recording. And um, let's see here. I don't want anybody to be locked out of the class. A lot of people are coming in. All right. Okay. All right. So today we are shifting focus. We are. Uh, uh, last week we spent time on uh, on or uh, uh, the last two weeks uh, on the scriptures. Uh, the authenticity, the accuracy of the scriptures. And today we are going to go forward into re changing focus. Um, and we're going to spend time uh, focusing on the person of Christ, right? So we've spent the first part of our course on God, creation, so on. Then we focused some lectures on the scriptures, the Bible, trying to understand that. And then today, uh, we're going to shift focus, focus on the person of Christ uh, and uh, questions around the person. And uh, so some of the things we want to understand is, first of all, the uniqueness of Christ. That's what we'll be doing today. That is, why do we say Christ is unique? Uh, this is very important in our world today because uh, when we talk about Christ as unique, he is the only way to salvation. He's the only savior. Uh, we have salvation only through him. Then immediately there is this backlash or response from the world in general that we are being intolerant that we are being uh, you know uh, close-minded uh, we have an air of air of superiority so whatever whatever all kinds of things that you know uh, when we say christ is unique and um, he's the only way to salvation so we want to discuss that and try to understand that. Uh, and, and, and sadly, uh, in many parts of the Christian world, even among Christian leaders, there's been a compromise or a change in message from saying Jesus is one, uh, from saying Jesus is the way, he is the Messiah, to, okay, he's one of the ways, you know, um, they're refusing to state categorically that he is unique. Uh, so sadly, there's there's been that change, or sometimes there's even been a change uh, into what we call as universalism. That is, uh, well, everybody's saved automatically because Jesus died for everybody. You know, so you can make everybody happy. <laughs> Uh, by telling them, you're automatically saved because Jesus died for you. He died for the sins of the whole world. So every human being is already saved. So, you know, people have tried to shift uh, uh, positions. I'm talking about Christian leaders, theologically. Um, uh, uh, because to stand by this fact that Christ is unique, first of all, you need to be convinced why he is unique and why he is the only way to salvation. And uh, 
and then it takes a lot of courage to, especially in today's world, to stand up and say, Christ is unique. But I'm sure that even the apostles in the early church, it wasn't easy to stand up and say, Christ is unique. Uh, because, you know, the philosophers of those days, they worshiped, you know, all gods, everybody. So to stand up there and say, Christ is unique, is the only way to salvation is, is very challenging. It, it was not easy for them and it's not easy for us today, but we need to be convinced on the uniqueness of Christ. So we're gonna focus on that. And then secondly, uh, we are, uh, or then we also wanna talk subsequently on the resurrection of Christ. Um, that, you know, how do we, uh, we are here 2000 years later, we were, we were not there when it happened. Uh, or just after it happened, we are here 2,000 years detached from that event that took place. So looking back, um, how do we piece evidence together and uh, from the information we have and um, how do we uh, substantiate the resurrection of Christ? So that would be another uh, question to look at as concerning the person of Christ. Okay, so we're going to spend some time on that uh, and then we will move on into uh, other topics like, uh, uh, you know, how do we present this unique Christ to a Hindu, unique Christ to a Muslim, some thoughts on that and uh, then get into other topics. Uh, we want to uh, have a section or, or we will have a section on social issues that is, um, you know, how do we respond to uh, uh, some of the dominant themes that are affecting society? So we will take some time to respond to that. And uh, then the last piece that we want to look at is uh, how do you respond to the questions related to suffering? If there is a good God, you know, why did he let the pandemic happen? Uh, why did so many lives get lost? I mean, die? Uh, why did so many lose their lives? Uh, you know, why is there suffering in this world? Uh, why is there terrible sicknesses and diseases? All these questions. And so the questions related to suffering, that'll be a last uh, topic. And then if, if, we, if we have time, you know, we'll just keep it open for any other things that might be of interest. So uh, the, the course notes, uh, the lecture notes for today's lectures are on your classwork section. And I'm just going to share, share it as we uh, go to the lectures today. Um, is that all okay? You all good? Everybody with me so far? The plan that we have in front of us? Okay. Nobody said yes. <laughs> so I'm assuming it's an yes. Okay. All right. Oh, okay. Darun was, oh, Darun, but I, uh, I just wanted to highlight uh, certain things. Uh, okay, Pastor. No problem. I'm just wondering. Yeah, I was just wondering uh, how to do that. Anyway, let's try this. I'll go ahead and share it. And um, let's see uh, how this works. Okay. Anyway, so the lecture notes are there. And if I need to, I'll just switch and I can have Tarun share this. But let's try this out for now. Uh, uh, so on the uniqueness of Christ, the person of Christ, right? So now uh, some people have tried to dismiss the uh, the person of Christ. Uh, hope people are still coming in. Hope they'll come in. Uh, some people have tried to dismiss the person of Christ by just dismissing his place in history. You know, uh, that's uh, quite a uh, task because, uh, you know, they try to say, well, Christ never existed in history. Uh, he was just a legend. He was just a story. He was just, uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, a figment of imagination that somebody came up with. Now that's a hard sell because uh, historically the, 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 the person of Christ, the fact that there was this person called Jesus of Nazareth uh, cannot be disputed. So there are uh, at least 19 ancient sources uh, that refer to Jesus Christ as a real person. So when somebody tries to just dismiss 
uh, Christ as a legend, as a story, as a fable, uh, and not part of history, that, that doesn't happen. So, you know, and, and, and we have uh, uh, various, uh, you know, uh, historians that you could reference that who have confirmed or wrote about Christ from that period of time or close to that period of time. You know, they wrote the recorded history. Now, um, the very fact that, uh, you know, all of human history was divided around this person should be evidence enough that, hey, Ted, this person lived. Otherwise, why would, you know, uh, why would somebody even think of dividing history prior to and after his life? And of course, uh, centered around that, we want the modern days trying to rephrase that, but, you know, the, the common era and the, uh, uh, by, by just trying to avoid, you know, making mention of uh, uh, the focus of the person of Christ. But regardless of what is done, the fact is, historically, there was this person, uh, uh, Jesus of Nazareth, and uh, he has been written about by historians from his day. So we, we can't buy into that of uh, trying to uh, dismiss Jesus as a fable or a myth or a legend or a story. Right? He was there historically. So why would this person, Christ, be absolutely unique? Like how, you know, we, you know, if we are going to say what the Bible says, um, why would we, you know, why would we present Jesus Christ as unique, right? And so I want us to think through on it. Some of these may be very basic, very simple, but nonetheless, we need to think through, understand this for ourselves and be convinced about it ourselves. Uh, then we can, you know, we, when we take our stand and say, Jesus Christ is unique, uh, we know why we're taking that stand. Right. So the objective here is, first of all, each one of us should be convinced about the uniqueness of Christ. And then we can share that with others and convince others about his uniqueness. Okay. So that's what we're going to go through. Um, again, I'm concerned about people being locked out of the class. Just a minute. All right. Let them come in. All right. Okay, so let's proceed. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at it in these nine statements that uh, I've put together. These, uh, some of these are, you know, common, but uh, some of these, when we get into it, uh, there may be some things that we want to really highlight. Huh? So first is about Christ's claim for himself. Uh, second, the Bible's statement about the person of Christ, the deity of Christ. Um, third, the Bible's statement about Christ's uniqueness. Number four, the incarnation, virgin birth of Christ. Why is that unique? Why is that so crucial and so important? Uh, number five, his life work, teaching, and impact on history. Uh, number six, the sect sacrificial death of Christ, number seven, the resurrection of Christ, number eight, the provision of salvation through faith in Christ, and number nine, his power to transform, heal, and deliver. So these nine statements, as we delve into each of these, I want you to understand them, of course, but also look at them from the perspective of why does this make Christ unique? Why? Does this particular piece or point or statement make Christ unique? I want you to think about it from that perspective. So number one, um, uh, Christ's claim for himself. This is something very unique. When you compare Jesus with, you know, uh, just in general, and if you're comparing a religious leader with other religious leaders, uh, Christ, in what he claimed, was very unique. He dared to make these kinds of statements. He said, I am the bread of life. 
That means I'm the one who satisfies your hunger, your spiritual hunger, and I am the one who gives you life. He said, I am the light of the world. Now that's pretty strong. I mean, it's the world, the implication is the world is in darkness. It needs the light I'm bringing, right? And he didn't say, I am one of the lights. I am the light of the world. And he said, next one, before Abraham was, I am. Now we will, we will be referencing this again a little later. But no other man stood up and said, hey, I was there before somebody who lived 2,000 years or before me or, you know, way back in time, before whatever time, whether it's 100 years or 200 years or 2,000 years or 4,000 years, before Abraham was, I am. Like, imagine if I stood up and said, hey, before my great-grandfather, I was. And that just wouldn't hold. But Jesus stood up and said, before Abraham was, I am. Now, whoever claimed that, that I was there back in time. You know, he said, I am the door of the sheep. I am the door of the sheep. That means the sheep, the people who belong to God, will have to go through me. I am the door. I am the good shepherd. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the true wine. So if you look at the I am claims of Jesus, it's very emphatic, it's very clear, it's categorical. There is no, I am like many others. Uh, so you can choose from all 10 of us whom you want to follow. No, it's not like that. He is saying, I am very different from anyone before me or anyone after me. This is who I am. So if he claimed that for himself, and if you and I say we believe in him for who he said he is, then we have no choice but to say, is unique because what he said I am unique I am the bread of life I am the light of the world I am before Abraham was I am so Christ was not ambiguous on who he was and so we claim to believe in this Jesus then we can't be ambiguous we can't be well, he's one of the many. Yeah, if you want to believe in him, it's okay. And if you want to choose somebody else, it's okay. Because that's not what he, how he positioned himself. So, at the very beginning, if you and I say we are followers of Christ, we are given no option but to say he is. And he alone is. There have been other religious leaders who will, you know, come and said, you know, I'll show you the way to live better. I will show you how to improve your life. I will show you, you know, some of the ways that you can attain salvation, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But Jesus didn't do that. He said, "I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life." After his death and resurrection. It's very clear. I am the one who lives. I was dead. I'm alive. And I've got the keys. Now, who said something like that? You know, that died, rose up again, alive, and then stating, look, I was alive. I was dead. I'm alive again. I've got the keys. 
right? So these claims of Christ, which of course are recorded for us in Revelation after his resurrection, again are very unique. His claims after his resurrection, that means he died and he rose again and he's made these claims. So he was more than just a good religious leader or a prophet or a teacher. Uh, he's very, very unique in what he claimed for himself. Right? So that's what we've said. He, he claimed to be the one and only and not one among many. So if you and I are going to say that, look, this is the Jesus we believe in, then we are left with no choice but to say this Jesus whom I believe in claimed to be unique. And not only that, he also claimed his oneness with the Father, with God. Like we said in John 8, he said, before Abraham was, I am. Now that's heavy. Why is that so, so strong? Because remember he's speaking to, to a Jewish audience the Jews referred to God as I am. And so here comes a man and he's claiming or saying before Abraham was, I am. He's using God's title for himself. That's why later on, you know, when the Jews were ready to apprehend him, uh, he asked them, you know, okay, uh, for which work, which one of the works are you going to stone me? And they said, look, because you're speaking blasphemy, you're making yourself God. So in the mind of the Jews, this was it. This man is claiming to be God. So when he said, before Abraham was, I am, when he said, I and my father are one, Basically, the message he was conveying was, I'm God. Now, who claimed that for themselves? And so we're just looking at the claims of Christ. We claimed he is, what he does for people, what he claimed after his resurrection. He claimed his pre-existence and his equality with God. And if you look at his prayer in John 17, in his prayer, he's praying and saying, Father, glorify me with yourself, with the glory I had with you before the foundation of the world, before the world was, John 17, 5. So he's praying. So here's a man who's praying. He's talking to the Father and says, Father, glorify me with, the, with yourself, with the glory which I had with you before the world was. That means before creation came, he was there with the Father. And he's saying, I had the same glory with you. Glorify me together with yourself. So there's no other spiritual leader who's made these kinds of claims. the claims of who he is to humanity, of who he is after his death and resurrection, of his equality with God and his pre-existence with God before creation. So either Jesus was totally out of his mind in making all these statements, he, he, like he just lost it and just gone out of his mind to make these erratic statements or these statements are true. Because he's not giving us any middle ground of, well, you know, I'm one of the many religious leaders, I'm teaching you nice things, no. Either he's completely out of his mind to make these kinds of statements or these statements are true. And if they are true, then he is the only one 
who made these kinds of statements and is unique, very unique in his claims. So that's the first thing. You and I cannot claim to say, cannot claim that we believe in this Jesus Christ and then compromise his claims. So if somebody says, I believe in Jesus, but he's not unique, then you're not believing in the same Jesus the Bible's talking about. Because the Jesus of the Bible said, I am the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Very categorical. So somebody says, you believe in Jesus? I believe in Jesus. But I also believe that you can go to God through person A and person B and person C. Well, then you don't, you, you don't believe in the Jesus of the Bible. You believe in some other Jesus. Because if Jesus of the Bible said, you cannot go to the Father except through me. If that's the Jesus you believe in, then you've got to say what he said. And his claim was very unique. He is the only one who said that he was with the Father before the world began. He was the only one who said before Abraham was, I am. He's the one who is the only one who rose up from the dead and said, I was dead, but now I'm alive. And that makes him very unique. So that's the first thing that makes Christ unique. There is no other Jesus like this Jesus. Secondly, uh, let me pause. Any questions on this? You all with me so far? Any questions? Okay, so that's the first thing. Why is Jesus unique? His claims for himself. He didn't give us any, uh, he gave us no choice. Either you believe me or you don't. If you believe me, you have to believe that I'm unique, is what Jesus said. Secondly, is what the Bible presents about Jesus, right? So when the Bible is presenting the same Jesus, so we have taken Jesus' words about himself. Now, what about the Bible? What does the Bible say about this Christ? So when the Bible talks about Jesus, it's clear that the Bible presents him as God. Now, people have tried to dispute it, and especially those who, uh, you know, we, we talk about the cults, like Jehovah's Witnesses and others, who try to disprove the deity of Christ. So they try to say, no, 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 he was a created being, and this is, and they use certain phrases. But they, they're using titles. They're using titles that, talk about a certain aspect of who he is. We want to see the full picture. If you want to know the person, you have to see the full picture. You'd also consider all the other titles that are there in the Bible, all the other things that the Bible says about him. And what does the Bible say about him? The Bible says, the word was God. The word was God. Yes, it does say he was in the beginning, he created everything, he was with God, but it says the word was God. There's no ambiguity about that. There is no, you know, it's not hard to understand. The word was God. This eternal word that we're talking about he is God. And this eternal word became flesh. The one who was God 
was the one who became flesh. So, the Bible is not ambiguous on this. The Bible is clear, explicit. The Word was God, and this eternal Word was the one who became the man. Again, in Philippians 2, 5 through 7, he was in the form of God. That means he was God, and he, every, whatever form and substance God was, this Christ was. And he did not hold on to this, to being equal with God. So, who is Jesus? The one who had the same form and substance is God. The one who was equal with God. And this person who was in substance God and equal with God came and made himself of no reputation. Means he came. So while the Bible talks about Jesus as the Son of Man, it talks about him as uh, the Son of God, it talks about him as the only begotten of the Father, it talks about him as the firstborn, it talks about him as, you know, so many other titles are there. That is true. But it also clearly states that this word was God. The one who was in form and substance God and who was equal with God is the one who became the man. So I should, I cannot just zero in on one title or two titles of Jesus as he is not God. No, no, no. There are titles that are, that talk about his humanity, that talk about him, you know, being a root and offspring of David and talks about the fact that he was born of the lineage of David and so on. Okay, yeah. But it also says, the same Bible also says, He is God. And I've given other references. We haven't written more of these. But uh, if you look at it, you know, you look at all of these references. First Timothy 16, God was manifested in the flesh. Very clear. God was manifested in the flesh. Romans 9, 5, Paul says that Christ Jesus the eternally blessed God. Romans 9 5. So Paul is referring to Jesus as the eternally blessed God. Isaiah 9 6. He is, he is referred to as the mighty God, the everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Who is this Jesus? The mighty God. Micah 5 2. The one who was from old, from eternity, he is the one who came out of Bethlehem. And I'm just paraphrasing it, but Micah says, the one, you know, he comes out of Bethlehem, the one who was from eternity. So, these are the references. But Jesus is referred to as God. So, this makes Jesus very unique. If I say I believe the Bible and what the Bible says about Jesus, then I have to believe that Jesus is God. Otherwise, I don't really believe the Bible. Some people will read the Bible and focus on the historic, historical Christ how Christ as a great teacher, Christ as a good man, Christ as a, you know, a person who broke away from Judaism, whatever, whatever. But all that said, this Bible also says he's God. What will I do with what the Bible is stating about the deity of Christ? So the second reason why Christ is unique. He's the only one in all of scripture, the only person, human person, 
in all of scripture who is called God so he is I cannot you know treat him like Abraham or Isaac or David or Solomon or anybody else he is God so when Islam says well we regard Christ as a prophet sorry he's more than a prophet he's God the Bible says he's God so that saying he's a prophet is not good enough it's not referring to the same Christ why is Christ unique first his claims for himself second the Bible's claim on who he is on the deity of Christ so this man is God we'll do one more before we go for the break the third is this third statement about the uniqueness of Christ the Bible when it presents Christ to us not only does it present to him as God but the Bible presents him as the only Savior the only Savior so here again you know if people ask why do you say that Christ is the only Savior well because the Bible says he's the only Savior and if I believe the Bible then that's the only thing I can say the Bible doesn't say give me options and say well you can be saved through Abraham or through David or through you know somebody else no the Bible says this is the Savior the one who was spoken of throughout the history um, throughout biblical history uh, all the prophets spoke about him and this one fulfilled all of those prophecies and this one is the Messiah so I'm just giving you some numbers here you know uh, more than 300 prophecies uh, fulfilled uh, by Christ's coming and uh, he he looks at the probability that one man okay so the, the, the whole thing is this there has to be one man who would fulfill all these prophecies So you take, uh, uh, you know, so here was somebody who did some work, uh, Peter Stoner. He took 48 major Old Testament prophecies. And then out of the 48, he said, let's just take eight of these. Okay. And uh, that means one man has to fulfill all eight. In reality, he has to fulfill all 300. And of course, some of the prophecies are out in the future uh, about a second coming, but there are 48 major ones and you just choose eight of those that he had to be born in Bethlehem he had to die like this etc and uh, so it has to be very you know one man has to fulfill all of these and he was just just using probability for one man to fulfill just eight of these prophecies he figured the probability is one in 10 raised to 17. And for one man to fulfill all 48 prophecies is one in 10 to the power of 157. So this one man, Jesus of Nazareth, fulfilled all 48. With this kind of probability so definitely it has to be this one man this one man is the Messiah he alone could be the Messiah not that's just from a you know a probability point of view but the the truth we want to emphasize is the Bible is itself saying that there's only one way for salvation it says there is no other name 
given under heaven among men by which we must be saved. It says there's one God, one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. So why is Christ unique? The number third statement is the Bible presents Christ as the unique way, the only way for salvation. No other way. So why is Christ unique? Three reasons that we considered just now. One, what he claimed for himself. Two, the Bible states that he's God. And three, the Bible states he's the only way for salvation. So if somebody asks you, you know, why do you say Jesus is the only way for salvation? Well, that's what the Bible says. And uh, we can state, I mean, if we believe the Bible, then that's what we have to state. We are not given an option. Or if we believe in the person of Jesus, he claimed, his claims are very unique. So we have no other option but to say he is unique. He is the way for salvation. Okay, I'm gonna pause here. Let's take, give some time for questions and then we will go into the, the other uh, six reasons right after the break. Uh, questions, okay, let me see now. Beth. Can you refer to Bible verses that others take to support their argument that you separate from God and explain them? John 14, 1 and a few others, but I don't have the references at hand. Okay. Maxon, I know Jesus the only way to way to our God of the Bible. Well, let's prove that Jesus Christ is our Lord. Should we say that Muslim Hindu also believes in the same God of the Bible or they got their own one God, which is very different to the God? of the Bible. All right, so, okay, let's respond to Beth's question. So Beth's question is, um, the verses that others take to talk about the Christ, that Jesus is separate from God, right? So, yeah, the, there are other scriptures, right? Where, so I understand, now what we need to understand, is this the Bible talks about one God but three persons Father Son Holy Spirit right so I'm just giving us the framework and so Beth I'm just uh, giving us a framework in which to understand all the other scriptures that people might use right so uh, so we understand God one God Three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So God the Father, God the Son, or God the Eternal Word, and God the Holy Spirit. Co-equal, three persons. And each person of the Godhead fully represents the Godhead. So God the Father is fully God. God the Eternal Word is fully God, God, Holy Spirit is fully God. And God, Holy Spirit, fully represents the Father and the Son, or the eternal word. God, the eternal word, fully represents the Father and the Spirit. So we understand that. So now, example, the Old Testament in Daniel 7, you will see the Ancient of Days and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of the Ancient of Days or in the presence of the Ancient of Days. That does not make, just because it's used the title Son of Man, does not make him any less than the Ancient of Days. And so when Jesus walked the earth, he said, you will see the Son of Man. He used the title Son of Man for himself. But that was an Old Testament title taken from Daniel chapter 7. And the Jews understood 
the Son of Man is the title of the one with the Ancient of Days that Daniel saw. And Jesus is using that title for himself. Now, that does not, so when, when somebody uses the word, says, takes the title Daniel, uh, son of man, it does not make him less than the father. So, okay, let me, so then we need to understand the incarnation. So in the incarnation, the eternal word laid aside his eternal glory, became a man and walked on the earth. And he used so many titles, like he used this, the title of the son of God. He, he was the son of God, the son of man, the son of David, so on. These are titles that describe his humanity, but they don't take away from his deity. But when somebody takes just the scriptures that you take these titles that describe his humanity, they can say, hey, look, he's not God, a son of David, son of man. Son of God. Well, you need to understand the full picture. That the one who's called the Son of God is also called the Eternal Word. So just because he has the title of Son of God, it's the title of Son of God is used to describe his incarnation and his willing submission to the Father. Just because he says the Father is greater than I, or you know, Corinthians talks about that, you know, he sub, the son submits all things to the father. That doesn't take away from the fact that the son is the eternal word. It's talking about what he did as the son of God, this, in his humanity, a role that he chose. He was willingly chose in order to redeem. And it's stepping into that role as his humanity, walking as, uh, as the Son of God, he willingly submitted himself to the Father. That doesn't take away from him being deity. Right? So if we have this framework, then regardless of what scripture, so then there's the other scriptures on being the firstborn from the dead, the first begot, the only begotten of the Father, the first begotten among many brethren, you know, so people use those titles. Well, it's talking about him being the only one to come forth from the Father and to be born as a man, the only begotten of the Father. That's why he's called the only begotten of the Father. That doesn't take away from his deity. He's only explaining a certain aspect of what he did. Because, oh, the first begotten from the dead, the first born from the dead, the first born among many brethren. Well, it's talking about the fact that he was the first person to be raised from the dead and that there'll be many others who will be like you know, sons, of, sons and daughters of God will also be raised from the dead. That's what it's talking about. It doesn't take away from his deity. So all these titles or like, you know, all these scriptures that people use to try to disprove the deity of Christ is simply because you're not seeing the entire picture. But when you have this framework and you understand clearly the eternal word who became the incarnate son of God, who became the resurrected Christ, who then became the glorified Christ, who is now seated at the right hand of the Father, co-equal with the Father, everything makes sense. Um, there is no discrepancy, there is no contradiction. So in response to Beth, your question, I think if you have a clear picture of the whole, you know, the, the triune God and what happened in incarnation and the resurrection, the ascension, then everything is clear. None of these scriptures are going to cause problems for us. Okay. So let me respond to Maxon's question, then we'll go for our break. Um, so, yeah. So, Maxon. The other religions believe in a God with a small g. And as far as the Bible says, there's only one God. He's the God of the Bible. And then there are many, you know, small gods or small g things that we have made, we have created. And they, it is not the same God as the eternal God of the Bible. Okay, 
So it is not correct to say that uh, somebody practicing another religion just believes in the same God in a different way. No, because the God of the Bible is unique. Did I answer your question, Maxon, or do you want to clarify something? No, thank you. You answered me. Okay. Okay. Everyone, let's take a, a little break. So while you have your refreshment, try to digest what we heard. And we come back. If you have any questions, we'll, be, we'll, we'll discuss them as well. Okay. Uh, I know we are five minutes over time. So we'll be back at, in 10 minutes. That's 10.05 Indian time. Okay, see you soon, thanks.